Hello friends, welcome to the weekly report, joined by my lovely and helpful wife Lucy. Okay. So as you know, the channel will now be including almost every week, it won't be every week because of time constraints and stuff like that, and I don't like to write BS kind of articles, my articles, I try to make them very academically grounded, mm -hmm. uh, very well cited, I try to understand the literature properly before I uh, publish anything. So not every week you're going to receive an article, but let's say three weeks out of every, uh, three times a month, something like that. Uh, last last time I did this, we uh, talked about uh, finasteride, how it affects the brain, how it affects neurosteroids in the mm -hmm. brain, and we talked about how you can work around this. And this uh, last week, last time was inspired by a question. Uh, this time, I decided, you know what? I'm not going to limit myself by the questions that are asked. Mm -hmm. I'm just going to decide to write about something that I think is interesting and something that somebody hasn't talked about before, at least in the public sphere. Now there are obviously. I'm not doing any research myself. I don't work in a research laboratory anymore and I don't do any research. Unfortunately, I'd like to do some research, but uh, to be honest with you, now, but like anyway. So, uh, but what I do do is I read academic articles that are already published. And so this information is out there, but the point is it's not in the public sphere sometimes. So I'd like to bring um, basically interesting information for people interested in uh, biohacking, improving their biology, either for a cognitive performance, for well-being, for longevity, uh, and to a much less degree for athletic performance. Not, I know you guys are mostly interested in athletic performance. If I was making videos, on, which I could do, on different things, if I was interested in it, uh, people would like it much better, but it's not what I'm interested in at the moment because, you know, that part of my life is already passed through. So, let me, so this week, what we're going to be talking about is erythropoietin, or also called EPO. Now, erythropoietin is something that most of you already know about. It's what cyclists take mm -hmm. to increase their uh, ability, cardiovascular ability. Runners take it. Some bodybuilders have been taking it. People say the bodybuilders shouldn't have been taking it, that there's no benefits for bodybuilders taking it, which is not true, actually, although it's very dangerous. Um, and this week's article is about erythropoietin's effect on the brain and how erythropoietin can be modified to produce uh, very uh, incredibly beneficial effects on the brain. And so there's a, there's a lot of research on this. It's been going on since around 2000. And it, now what this video is gonna be is just sort of a really high level summary. And the reason why is because I spent a lot of time writing the article and I want you guys to read it. <laughs> and you will find that some parts of the article, like last week, some parts are uh, very bi uh, technical about uh, biology and chemistry and stuff like that, that's fine. Uh, if you don't fully understand those parts, that's all right. Just read it anyway, because it's helpful for you to, to, to see the grounding and to, to understand the details of molecularly how things are thought to happen. Mm -hmm. But you're still, my articles are not written to be published in academic journals. So actually, if you look at the last week's article, you could see that the first half of the article, or in fact, the first two thirds could be published as a, as a review in academic journal. In fact, it probably if I, if I uh, tried to, I could get it published. Uh, the same will be true uh, of this article if you see it, but the second part of my article is, is really functional. It's about speculation. What can we do with what we know now to benefit us in the short term? So if you read through the article, even though there may be start stuff that gets a little bit too technical for you, by the time you get to the end of these articles, you're going to say, oh, wait a minute, I could, uh, last week you find out, well, maybe I could make a nasal spray with progesterone and pregnenolone. Uh, and, and maybe I could uh, take uh, this interesting drug that agonizes the progesterone receptor without acting completely like progesterone in the body. Or maybe, you know, or maybe I could affect my allopregnanolone with an allopregnanolone synth synthetic analog. And these are things that could really impact your life. And now you're at the cutting edge. So recently I had the pl great pleasure to talk to John Romano on the podcast. And John Romano, as everyone knows, was a very close friend of Dan Duchesne. Dan Duchesne was the first uh, bodybuilding uh, steroid or PED guru. He introduced uh, clenbuterol, GHB, uh, DNP, all of these compounds to the bodybuilders. But these compounds, except for DNP, which was not being produced much at the time, uh, these compounds were no regular medicines and he would look at the side effects and see what could I do with it. The things that I'm talking about, like what I talked about last week and what I'm talking about this week, are things that are not produced. Mm -hmm. This is not I'm going into uh, some, some medicine that's given for some certain disease and saying, oh, if we take this, we could get that. I'm going into the next, the future, and trying to bring the future closer to us. So in the future, there will be progesterone sprays. There will be allopregnanolone analogs used by a lot of people. But what we'd like to do is try to get that closer to us now. So today we're going to talk about erythropoietin, which is a very interesting uh, subject. So to introduce that to you, um, 
First of all, erythropoietin is the main er er erythropoietic uh, hormone in the body. It's a cytokine. Um, what it does is basically increase red blood cells, which is erythropoiesis, mm -hmm. the production of red blood cells um, in the, uh, in, from the bone marrow into the, uh, into, the, um, into the blood. So when you take erythropoietin, you get uh, higher amounts of uh, red blood cells. Your hematocrit goes up and stuff like that. And in an adult, and actually in, 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 the, in the youth, the erythropoietin can produce, be produced by the liver as well, but in an adult, it's only produced by the kidneys. Mm -hmm. um, erythropoietin is most known for its red blood cell effect, which increases the oxygen carrying capacity of someone, like an athlete, making a cyclist immediately within a few days. Uh, and, and by the way, my article is about the brain, but I do go over the different uh, erythropoietin uh, compounds based out of erythropoietin that could be used for uh, athletes as well, because there's a variety of them. For example, uh, bodybuilders always say the problem with erythropoietin is it's long acting. So if I take it every day, it's going to stay in my body for so long. But they're not all like that. Some are long acting, some are not long acting, mm -hmm. and, and so there's different varieties of them, and, and people are very into this because they've been trying to uh, beat the uh, WADA doping uh, stuff. But anyway, the point is, erythropoietin is most known for this athletic effect, but it actually has a very strong tissue protective effect as well. So this is why a bodybuilder, so for example, a lot of these bodybuilding coaches say, Oh, uh, bodybuilders should never take it, be taking erythropoietin. That's for a cyclist, and uh, uh, even if it gives you more endurance in the gym, it's not going to add much muscle to you. Ah, that's not uh, totally true, actually. Erythropoietin uh, is uh, very good at healing mu muscle tissue, and not through the red blood cell part. It has a separate effect. Mm. So erythropoietin agonizes more than one receptor. It agonizes the EPO receptor, the erythropoietin receptor, more uh, strongly. But it also agonizes, as you'll see in my paper, uh, at, at least one other receptor we really know about, and it probably agonizes two other receptors as well. And through these, uh, the agonism of these receptors, it exerts a tissue protective effect. So it also uh, inhibits uh, metabolic syndrome. It has effects on the liver. It has effects on the heart. Uh, it uh, can heal heart tissue after cardiac uh, after my myocardial infarction. Mm -hmm. uh, it can heal uh, tissue after uh, aneurysms, after strokes. Are doctor prescribing it or like uh, giving it to patients? Well, well, there's a reason they're not, and mm -hmm. we'll tell you in a second. But but they are giving it to anemic patients. Okay. Anemic patients are patients who have a problem with that ori originally, and they give it to a couple of other diseases. But there's a reason they're not, and that's what we're going to get to in a second, which is very important. So, but the, but the point is, erythropoietin has through these uh, different receptors uh, affects tissue protection and uh, healing and things like that, other than its effect on erythropoiesis, the re creation of red blood cells. But what's the problem with erythropoietin, which you bring up? Why are they not prescribing it to people since it heals so many things and does so many things in the body? Well, actually it's a couple of problems, but let's start with the big problems. The big problem is the red blood cell creation. When your red blood cells, when erythropoiesis is upregulated that quickly, there can be many side effects in the body, not just hypertension or uh, uh, different kinds. Basically, you get cardiovascular side effects. I see. Severe cardiovascular side effects because your blood gets very thick. Mm -hmm. So you can get damaged, you can have a lot of outcomes, stroke, all kinds of things like that. So, but the, but the thing is, people are wondering, is, is erythropoietin's tissue protective effect, which all I haven't mentioned so far, erythropoietin has this tissue protective effect. But it has a really profound effect, as I was saying, but in more detail, let's talk about it, on neuroprotection and neurogenesis. Mm -hmm. Not just the genesis of new neurons, but the genesis of oligo oligodendrocytes, which are the myelating producing uh, parts of the, of the brain. Uh, it, it has uh, profound effects on uh, brain plasticity through this. Uh, it has a neuroprotective effect that includes oxidative stress, excitotoxicity from glutamate or dopamine. It protects against uh, animal models of Parkinson's disease, uh, uh, Alzheimer's disease. It protects against beta amyloid uh, toxicity, which comes, beta amyloid is the plaques that come from Alzheimer's disease. It has really, really, really profound, it even improves memory, improves cognitive function. It has really profound effects on the brain. Uh, the thing is, people that were not sure does this depend somewhat on the erythropoietic effect? Mm -hmm. So, uh, which is a problem because if it did, then you're not going to be able yeah. to. You, you'll get the red blood cells. People have a stroke before exactly. they can help their brain, and it may protect you from the stroke, but still you're having the stroke. Have stroke. So you don't want to have that. So, what researchers basically find out, as you you read in my article, you read in more detail, but researchers basically find out that no, if you, if you separate the erythropoietic effect from it, mm -hmm. um, you still have the effect. You still have the effect, and mm -hmm. they did this a couple of ways, and one of the ways by uh, 
uh, carbomylating the uh, molecule. One of the ways is by uh, removing salic acid as, or salic acid, whatever, however you say it, uh, from the molecule. Another way is by taking peptides from the molecule, so simplifying the amino acid structure and taking peptides out of the erythropoietin molecule to see does this part of the molecule work by itself and produce the neuroprotective effect. And so a, lar a, lar a large part of the article is about these peptides. In fact, I'm now in communication with one of the top researchers on the peptides, and I I'm trying to convince her to come on the uh, on the podcast. It's hard to convince academics to come on podcasts, especially when the podcast is small. Which is why, guys, I always tell you, please like the videos, subscribe, and tell people about the channel, because the, the reason I care really most is the, the more we get subscribers, the better interviews I'll be able to get you guys, really. So like, subscribe, and, and like every video, for God's sake. You you guys, a hundred of you watch the video and you don't like the video. Well, that's going to be harder to get good interviews. If you all, if a hundred of you watch it and all of you like the video, no matter what, I'm going to get better interviews, I promise you. This is this is the main issue. I'm telling people, like, could you come on my channel? And then they look at the channel and they're like, oh, you only got, uh, you know, this uh, hundred views on your last thing and you got a hundred, a thousand subscribers. So they don't want to come. But the point <laughs> is, I'm trying to convince this researcher to come. The point is, my article goes into detail about the difference. So erythropoietin, how they first realizes it's erythropoietin when it's in the brain it, it, it doesn't have the salic acid uh, part of the molecule so mm -hmm. they call it neuro epo, e, neuro epo or epo, epo and neuro epo which is not patented is similar to this patented version called azealo epo which is produced by Japanese and both of these don't have the salic acid thing and they don't have this erythropoietic effect but now depending on these different molecules that I'm mentioning to you guys including the peptides some of them agonize the EP, the EP, so EP, actually two parts of the original EPO molecule mm -hmm. or EPO molecule agonize uh, the EPO receptor actually in two places one with high affinity one with low affinity so some of these molecules will agonize from the site one some will agonize it from the site two some don't actually agonize the EPO receptor uh, and they agonize the other receptors so it's a lot of things but all of them show neuroprotective benefits so they're very interesting now the great thing about them, especially the peptide versions, is this. The problem with EPO is this. To be able to get the neuroprotective effect, you have to get it in the brain. To get it in the brain, you have to, sorry guys, my eyes are very dry from the finasteride. That's one of the, the side effects of that. But to be able to get it in the brain, you have to be able to dose it at such a high dose, much higher dose than you would use for anemics. So to the point that their hematocrit is getting so high, it's really dangerous. Why? Because the molecule EPO is a big molecule. But when you make the molecule smaller, especially in the peptide versions, it's more permeable, more, it's easier to permeate the blood-brain barrier. Interesting. So it can get into the, through systemic injection. So you can inject it in the muscle. By the way, there are also uh, ways to do this through gene doping. And I mentioned a, uh, probably one or two studies on that. I'm not as interested in that subject right now because the technology isn't there yet. So I didn't go into too much detail. But you can also do this through gene doping. They did it through inter intramuscular injections, which I always thought, thought about it. But the point is, you can inject in the muscle or in the, in the veins, and these small molecules will go to the brain. Now, another way to do this is through what I mentioned last week, which is intranasal delivery. So there's a couple of devices already developed for intranasal de uh, delivery. They either propel the, the molecule, or the, it's a powder or a liquid. They either mm -hmm. propel it into your nose. Uh, they haven't developed for EPO. They're just, they exist. Exactly. So if you can go to a lab and create one of these peptides, where all these uh, research chemical websites make all these stupid peptides for growth hormone, which <laughs> barely do anything. We could get these EPO peptides, get no erythropoietin, have systemic tissue protection, brain pr tissue protection, amazing benefits. But these guys, what happens, they don't read papers. So the guys who are actually doing this, they want to make money. They're not academically inclined. And so they know people know about growth hormone. So let me go make a growth hormone peptide. It's going to sell. So what we need to do is get people educated about the other things that exist, like progesterone. Last week we talked about this week we talked about EPO. Get people educated about this so that those guys who are financially driven can realize, okay, there's a reason for me to make the molecule. People will buy it. So tell people about this if you can. Tell people about the video or tell people about the molecule. You don't need to tell them about me. Just tell them about the, about the video and the peptide. And if you read the article, send it to people or tell people what you learned. Uh, that's how I ended my last article. I was like, listen, what you learned here, tell it to people. Uh, you tell them about the article or don't tell them, but we want to get great demand for this stuff because it cost me a lot of money to go, to go make it for myself. But if we can get one of these financially inclined mm -hmm. guys to go make it, then we can all benefit. You know what I mean? So, uh, and you know, I, I have, uh, you know, people are, people are interested in doing it. But the point is um, about erythropoietin. So these peptides, they cross very easily. Now, 
you could use an intranasal delivery either through a powder or, or a liquid and it could either propel it into your nose or you could get there's one actually product that's in the market that you it, it works through inhalation you just inhale through the nose mm -hmm. why do you want to get it through the nose well basically in the nose you have the nasal cavity cavity but behind the nasal cavity you have actually an exposed area of the brain called the olfactory bulb and the neurons there are literally exposed now when people take cocaine and stuff like that they snort it they're probably getting it absorbed i'm not completely sure i haven't looked at it but they're probably getting it absorbed through the uh, the vascular structure of the navel cavity i don't know if they're actually getting it into the olfactory bulb because a molecule has to be quite small even if it does get to the olfactory bulb and the neurons there for it to spread through the brain, it has mm -hmm. to be very small, the molecule. So researchers are looking a lot at nanoparticles for this. Nice. But uh, the point is, if you can get a molecule small enough, so I don't know if micronized progesterone is small enough that if you inhale it, I mean, if you if you put it through the nose and nasal delivery, will it go past the olfactory bulb and get spread out through the brain or not? I'm not sure, micronized. But if it was a nanoparticle, it would, which would be really wonderful. So the point is, but, but, but these peptides that I'm talking about here, you don't need to do that technically. These things have been studied through IV injection or through intramuscular injection. They're going to spread through your body and they're going to go into your brain, but they're also going to be tissue protective in different parts of your body. So you can heal your muscles faster when you go to the gym. You know, so when people tell you, no, EPO is useless, it's just raise your... First of all, let me tell you another thing that these uh, coaches don't know is that they say uh, testosterone is already raising your hematocrit. Testosterone is raising, raising your blood cell count and, and your hematocrit through EPO mediated ways and non EPO mediated ways, both. They don't know that actually. So it does have an EPO effect. They don't even realize that. And it has non EPO related effect, but, but EPO or EPO or whatever, this thing again, it's hard to, but whatever it is, it has a tissue protective effect and a regenerative effect that is profound. Now, the erythropoietin molecule also has an angiogenic effect, which means it produces a more vascular structure and mm -hmm. stuff like that. And that's very dangerous because tumor cells have EPO receptors on them. And so and you don't want to increase the vascular structure in a tumor. So potentially it could increase the development of cancers. That's the full erythro erythropoietin molecule. But these peptide molecules, some of them don't have angiogenic effects. So it wouldn't have that effect either. How do you know which one's which? I mean, uh, from the research, they have to study them, and, and from reading the paper. So read the paper. Mm -hmm. You'll learn more about it. This is the first time someone on YouTube has talked about erythropoietin for purposes of uh, maintaining, preserving brain health, improving memory, uh, Im improving cognition, uh, even improving well-being. These things have effects on well-being as well through the neurogenic effects. They will improve uh, de depressive symptoms. Now, they haven't been studied as much in this regard, but actually erythropoietin has, but the peptides haven't been studied in this regard. But it is a very promising thing. I hope you guys wish me luck to convince some of these academics to come on the channel because I have a lot of questions and it'll be a very interesting discussion. And uh, you know, since I'm not a biologist, I'll be asking at a, at a level of question where everybody can participate and everybody will learn and we can we can start. So what Dan Duchesne was, he found other other drugs that can be used for, for, for this purpose. What I'm trying to do is find new things that so we can push to the newer level, but safe things, things mm -hmm. that are safe. So erythropoietin peptides fall in that category. Please guys read the paper and uh, like and subscribe and support the channel and we'll see you next time.